Um, right now, grab your Bibles and uh, let's open up to the book of James. We are back in the book of James. We took a break for a couple weeks. Back in the book of James in a series titled Life Tools. And if you are new this morning, welcome. So glad you're here. Caitlin, great to see you. Glad you're here. Uh, if you're new this morning, welcome. So glad that you're here. So glad you're here. Um, it's, uh, we're in a series called Life Tools, and, and here's where we're at. Uh, James uh, has written some very practical instruction to give us tools to go through life. Nothing like a good tool. If you're a dad, I know you like getting tools on Father's Day. I love getting tools, hint, 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 kids, on Father's Day. Tools are awesome. But tools for life are even more, the, uh, even more important because we need good tools to go through life. And so we've looked at some tools in this, in this series. What to do when you don't know what to do. Yeah, I need some tools for that. James gives it to us. Uh, how to handle temptation. Yeah, we got, uh, need to know how to, how to do that because we're, so many things tempt us in this world. Tools for successful living. We spent three weeks going through that. And if you missed any of those, you can go back on our website or on our podcast and download, the, download them for free. Uh, but today we're going to be looking at some tools for dealing with discrimination. Tools for having victory over superficial judging. We've all heard it said before, you should never judge a book by, by its cover. Why not? Why? Well, you might miss out on a really good book. Yeah, you don't judge a book by its cover. You judge a book by its table of contents, by the, the author behind it, by the story itself. And yet in life, here's what I know we are prone to be somewhat superficial. We look at things and we go, hmm, and we don't really appraise things accurately. And so James is going to give us some good tools to deal with discrimination. Superficial looking at things that causes us problems that we might have more wisdom, more insight, and uh, actually be better at the ministry that Jesus has called us to. So, let's jump in. Let's pray as we do. Uh, Jesus, we've prayed to you many times already this morning, but Lord, we know that we have nothing unless you provide it. Every good gift comes from you. And so, Lord, open our eyes that we might see the good things that are in your word this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 2, picking up right where we left off a few weeks ago. If you're there in your Bible, say amen. Let me hear you, church. Are you there? All right, here we go. My brethren, that would be you and me. That would be Christian brothers and Christian sisters. The family of God. I love the family of God. I'm looking at these newborns and these new moms and dads, and you know what I'm seeing? The church bringing all these meals and all these blessings. Just love the family of God. Chapter 2, my brethren, brothers and sisters, my family, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory, all His glory. Do not hold it with partiality, with favoritism, with prejudice, with a superficial, I don't like, I like. And then he gives an example. For if there should come into your assembly, if a guy should come into the mission church, and he's wearing gold rings and fine apparel. And there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. He stinks, he smells, hair's dirty. And you pay attention to the one driving the Ferrari, wearing the fine clothes. He's the president of Viasat. Oh, did you see who's here? Oh, wow. He's the CEO of whatever. Look who's here. And you say to him, you sit here in a good place. Would you like a donut? Can I get you a coffee? And you say to the poor man, did you shower this morning? Why don't you sit here in the back? You sit here. Sit here at my footstool, stinky guy. We don't really want you up front. 
And I wonder, you know, how would we treat someone who came in this morning who was pretty stinky? Would you be perturbed? If they were sitting next to you right now, go ahead and give a whiff. Take a... <laughs> Some of you did that. I'm like shocked. Uh, yeah, would you be upset? Would you be like, oh, what's this? Would you be, or would you be praising the Lord? You know, this is a place where stinky people come to get clean. And guess who those stinky people are? That's me. I am one of those that stinketh, right? That's us. And uh, here he says, hey, if that poor guy comes in, would you say, hey, sit here in the back? Verse 4, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Hey, what? think about what's really going on. What's the motive behind you putting that rich guy up front? That famous person, that really attractive. What's your motive behind putting them up front? And why are you disdaining the poor guy? Verse 5, listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Hey, take a sidebar just from our study for a second. Take a sidebar from the context and just underline a couple words. Heirs of the kingdom. Circle that. Which he promised. Underline that. You know what you are, church? You are a what? Heir of the kingdom by Jesus' promise. That's amazing. That's amazing. And here James says, hey, look, when you are mean to the stinky dude who really needs God's love, do you realize what's happening? You're being cruel to an heir of the kingdom, to one that God has set his love upon. God's, God loves the poor. As a matter of fact, God instructs us to be what? Poor, poor, poor in spirit. Poor in spirit, Jesus, on the Sermon on the Mount, how did He start it off? Blessed. Oh, how happy. Oh, what a great place to be when you are poor in spirit. Why? Because yours is the kingdom of God. Yeah, when we will humble ourselves, when we will be poor in spirit, when we will say, oh, no, 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 no. I am nothing. Lord, your mercy, your grace upon me. Lord, I need you. I messed up so bad. I need your forgiveness. Oh, Lord, I'm not who I want to be. Oh, Lord, please make me a better man. Jesus says, blessed are you. When you have your hand out because you need God to move, God says, oh, blessed are you. If you're sitting here rich in spirit today, Rich in pride, I don't need anything. They're lucky they're getting my tithe check today. What would God do without me? Oh, I pity your soul. Let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. But those who are poor, those who are stinky, those who are painfully aware of how fall, short they fall, he says, listen, yours is the heir. You are the heir of the kingdom. And this is my promise to those who love me, verse 5 says. Verse 6, but here's the problem. When we discriminate, he says, you have dishonored the poor man. You've dishonored the heir of the kingdom. You've dishonored the one that God has set his love upon you. Upon. And he says, do do not the rich, think about this, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Aren't they the ones who blaspheme the noble name by which you were called? Yeah, you know the movie stars that we esteem? The ones that we roll out the red carpet for and turn on our TV to watch and go to the movies and, and support financially and buy the clothes that they wear and the perfume that they advertise? He says, aren't they the ones who are blaspheming me? 
Why then do they have your favor? Why are you desiring and giving your approval and favor to the ones who blaspheme, blaspheme my holy name? Verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law, look at this word, royal law. To my knowledge, I don't know anywhere else that's in Scripture. The royal law, he's talking back, royal refers to what? A kingdom. To the kingdom of heaven, to this divine inheritance. If you really fulfill this kingdom law, here's what he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, if you do that, you will do well. Love your neighbor as you... Well, who is my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? It's that stinky guy. That's your neighbor. We, we are called to love those who are easy to love and those who are difficult to love. And we don't love them because we're trying to get something out of them. We love them because God's love is uncaused by us. Do you know that God's love for you is uncaused by you? And now He wants that same love flowing through us. Love your neighbor just as you love yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Some important instruction for us to see there. If we show partiality, if we judge superficially, we enter into a spot. We are now no longer walking in the love of Christ, but we're now walking in sin. And I look at this story, and I consider its source, and I want to bring you back there. James, who was James? We've talked about this as we're in this. Who was James? The brother of Jesus Christ. Born to the same mother, Mary was his mother, Mary was Jesus' mother, different father. Uh, James' father was Joseph, Jesus' father was God, but the same family of origin. And James being the half-brother of Jesus, here imagine if your brother was God in a human body. Crazy. James grew up with God in a human body. But you know what? Because James looked on the outside, guess what happened? James missed out on all that. He did not understand all that. James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. James did not believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. James was a leader of the church in Jerusalem, but he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after Jesus resurrected. Paul tells us in Corinthians that James, Jesus, appeared to James bodily after the resurrection. And when James saw him, he then changed and he believed. But if you look back and you think of James and growing up with his brother, he didn't believe. Why didn't he believe? Why didn't he believe that Jesus was the Messiah? You know why? Because he did what we all do. You know what he did? He judged by the outward appearance. He judged by the outward appearance. And it controlled all of his thinking, what he saw on, on the surface. James is telling us, it was the biggest mistake of my life. It was the biggest mistake of my life. I can't believe I went through life not even acknowledging. Think about that. And so he writes this book to give us life tools. James is the first book written in the New Testament. Did you know that? Written in about 45 AD, just a few years after Jesus' death. Well, the first book of the New Testament. James writes this book to give us some life tools to live successfully, to avoid making the mistakes that he made. And here this life tool that he gives us, here it is, do not judge by appearance. That's his instruction to us. Do not judge by appearance. And I can hear James's heart as we read through this. I know James gives a lot of just matter of fact, hey, do this, do this, do this, do this. But don't miss his heart in this. Don't miss his heart. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, I did that. I judge by appearance. 
And it cost me so much. I looked at Jesus and I said, no way, you're not. You're, why did he do that? Because he judged by appearance. And, and he looked at him, you know, and, and Jesus, he was just a normal guy. He wasn't handsome. He wasn't rich. He didn't glow in the dark at night when he climbed up on the top bunk and said goodnight to James. He, Jesus didn't glow in the dark. He didn't have a halo over his head. He didn't walk around performing miracles everywhere he went. He was just a regular guy as he grew up. And on the outside, he looked totally normal. He went to school. He did chores. He went through puberty. He, he did all the things a normal person would do. He got a job. He became a carpenter. We don't know if it was a wood carpenter or a stone mason or what, but he was a really good carpenter. And he looked just like a regular guy. Looked like a regular dude. And on the outside, you could not even tell. Isaiah says he has no form or beauty so that when we would see him, we would expect anything. He looked like a regular guy. Isn't that how God moves? Isn't that just how God moves? He moves in very natural ways in our life, and yet he's doing the supernatural. And Jesus looked like a regular guy, and yet he was God. And James only judged by the outside. And James had learned what we all need to learn. Judging by appearance blinds us to truth. Judging by appearance blinds us to truth. If we look at things on the surface, here's what will happen. We will go no further. We will not be able to see the truth and the depth that's behind it. If we judge by appearance, we will not see anything else. What if James would have not judged Jesus by appearance? What if he would have not looked on just the outside? He would have heard his words. He would have heard his words and he would have understood, oh my goodness. This man speaks like I've never heard before. That's what others heard who weren't looking at the outside. But James could not hear what was right in front of him because when we judge by appearance, it blinds us to the truth. Jesus then appeared to James after his resurrection and James believed. And I want to embellish for a moment. I want us to just kind of imagine, what was that like? Think about James. He sees Jesus resurrected. And he realizes, oh my gosh, what a fool I've been. And he goes, can you imagine? He goes to the disciples. And I can imagine him going to the disciples and saying, hey, hey tell me. What was it like on the Mount of Olives when he gave the Sermon on the Mount? I never heard it because I mocked him and I left. What did he say? What did he say? The Gospels weren't written yet. What did he say? I want to know. Oh, his teachings. What, what, what did he teach? I didn't value him. What did he say? When the religious leaders tried to trick him, what did he say? What did he do? The woman at the well who had been divorced five times. What did Jesus say when he came to a woman who was divorced? What did he do? The woman caught in the act of adultery. What did he say? Because I feel like I've blown it in so many fronts. What did he tell that woman who was divorced five times? What did he tell that person who really messed up? Please tell me. I really want to know. What did he say to that woman who was divorced? Because I denied him my whole life. Well, here's what he said, James. He said, you drink this water, you're going to thirst again. But if you drink the water that I'll give you, you'll never thirst again. He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who was standing before you, you would ask him and he would give you eternal life, his Holy Spirit. James, he loves to forgive. Really? That's what he said? And I can imagine James drinking this in and really 
kind of saying, wow, I, you know, when you guys sat at the campfire at night and you sat around, what did he say? James realizing how judging by appearance had robbed him so severely. And I think James would be telling us the reason he's writing this is just saying, hey, look, man, I did that. I did that. Don't judge by appearance. Don't do it. The second instruction he gives us here is in verse 1. He tells us now to let our love be without partiality to status. Don't let your love be partial to things of superficial status. Don't put your love on the rich guy that comes into the room. Don't bring the rich guy up front. Don't let your love be partial. Do you know that God, the Bible tells us, is no respecter of persons? What does that mean? God is no respecter of persons, the Scripture tells us. What does that mean? It means that God doesn't really give a rip if you're super wealthy or if you're homeless. All men are equal in His eyes. God doesn't really give a rip if you are an esteemed CEO of a Fortune 500 company and you walk in, and when I say do this, they do that, hey, good for you. But I'm just as interested in the babysitter. And I love how she's loving that child. God is no respecter of persons' status. It doesn't matter to Him. You might be mega rich. You might be dirt poor. You might be black. You might be white. You might be a CEO of Apple. You might be living in the gutter. The good news is, is God is no respecter of status. And all through Scripture, we see it to be true. Jesus, He actually spent more time with the poor than He did with the rich. He treated the pauper and the king equally. And Jesus loves us without partiality. Now that's good news if you're down and out. That's good news if you're not one of the, you know, Rancho Santa Fe elite. That's good news. You have the same access to God as the CEO, as the celebrity, as the king, as a pastor. You have the same access to God. That's good news. But, on the other hand, if you're rich, if you're famous, if you think you are better than other people, that might not be such good news to you. You might be thinking that you deserve favored status. Which is why Jesus said, not my words, but his words. Tim, happy Father's Day to you, by the way. Why don't you stand up for us one second? I should have done this earlier. Let's all give Tim a hand. You know what Tim's first Father's Day? He uh, adopted little Chiron back in, when was it official? May 19th. And uh, prayed for that boy and prayed for that boy and prayed for that boy and, and adopted little Chiron. Let's give him a, just a happy Father's Day to you. Yeah, that was a huge blessing from the Lord. And great to see you guys doing so good uh, just raising that little boy. But back to our spot. That's why Jesus said, hey, if you're thinking like, wow, well, I'm really something. Uh, Don't you know who I am? You're lucky I'm here today. That's why Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And when the disciples heard that, they were blown away. They go, oh, my gosh, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, well, with men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. But here's the thing. Humble yourself. Let's not be thinking too highly of ourselves. It will destroy us. The truth of it is this. None of us come to God on our own merit. None of us come to God on our own merit. You Bible scholars out there, let me hear you say this verse with me. Romans 3.23 All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Another verse. There is none righteous, no, not one. 
Yeah, all of us. Uh, there's no rich people in heaven. There's no powerful people that earn their way to heaven. There is none. None. We're all stinky in God's eyes. And fortunately, God loves stinky people. And here's what he says. This is a verse for you. Romans 5.8 on your screens. Let me hear you read it. God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah, even when we were enemies, even when we were stinky, even when we were fighting against God, even when we walked into church and say, I don't know if I believe in this God, God still loved us and He set His affection upon us so much so that He died for us on the cross. And the thief was there condemning Him, saying, oh, you're just a loser. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. And that thief heard that. His heart was touched and his life turned around and he became a child of God. That is the good news. And therefore, we're all stinky kids. Therefore, let's live without partiality to status. It's the wrong thing to do. The ground is level at the cross of Jesus. God shows no partiality to status. And He instructs us to do the same. Now as a little sidebar, I do want to take a, just make, make this known. God is not partial to status. But that does not mean that everyone has the same intimacy with God. Because God is partial to faith. To faith. And so not everybody has the same walk with God. We're not all children of God. No, no, no. God has set His affection upon those who by faith become children of God. And faith is very pleasing to God. Some people do have more of an intimate relationship with Jesus than others. But that intimacy is not based on their status. It's based on their faith. Take a look at verse 23 of chapter 1. We'll look at this in the upcoming weeks. But uh, let's look at, uh, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 23. Look what it says about Abraham. And the Scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God. Or in other words, Abraham had faith in God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called what? A friend of God. Yeah, we can have a favored position with God by faith. Not by status, but by faith. And I like that. I am thankful for that. I am thankful that we can be a friend of God when we deny our flesh and live by faith and really seek Him. God is not a respecter of status or position, uh, he, but He is a respecter of faith. He loves faith. And we can please Him by faith. And so He says, listen, I don't want you to be living with partiality to status. That's not how I move, and I don't want you to move that way. I want you to, to love like I love. And so when the rich man comes to church and the poor man church comes to church, may you show the same favor to the poor man. I want you to consider something for a second. Do you know rich people, people who are really wealthy, do you know they live in a severe disadvantage all the time? I see raised eyebrows like, I'd like to have that disadvantage. I understand. I would like to be wealthy too. It'd be nice. But they live at a severe disadvantage. When they go to make friends, what's the disadvantage? When they go to choose a spouse, what's the disadvantage? Yeah, everywhere they go, they have this problem. I read an article on a gal who uh, was a... Uh, I forget what country, but somewhere in Europe, and she won some mega lottery, like it's really huge. And it would have been like three or four years after, and she said it was the worst day of my life. She says, I, I love the money too much. I don't want to give it up. But now I have all these people around me all the time, and I have no idea who is my real friend. She was only 20 years old. She said, I don't know how I'm ever going to get a man. And she's got lots of proposals. But suddenly the world is now through a different filter. And she was battling that dilemma. Rich people are at a tremendous disadvantage. They've got people coming around them all the time, but they never know the motive. 
And you know what God says? I don't want church to be like that for them. I want them to come to church and I want them to be treated like a regular dude. I don't want you making a big deal about the NFL player who gets saved. And you put him up on the pulpit and you kill him because he can't handle the weight of all that. He knows nothing. He gets lifted up with pride and he falls into the same condemnation as the devil. I told you that, God says, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, by the way. And so, we are to be different at the church. Let's not elevate the rich. Let's treat the rich and the poor the same. Here's what happens when the rich guy comes to church. Everyone goes, wow, maybe I could be his friend. And the real estate guy starts coming up to the rich guy and says, hey, nice to meet you. Are you new here? Ulterior motive, ulterior motive. And the LinkedIn guy comes up and says, hey, nice to meet you. And the financial planner, and on and on and on and on it goes. The guy unhappy with his job. And you know what's really sad to me? The pastor comes up to that guy. And he gets an extra card in the mail. And he gets an extra email. And he gets an extra phone call. And he gets invited to lunch. And he gets invited to the Padre game. And really? Really? That ought not be, James tells us. That ought not be. And the same thing happens to the attractive, to the famous, to the pro athlete. And Jesus says that ought not be. James says, hey, listen, don't judge that way. I did that. It was the biggest mistake of my life. And that's his instruction to us. And a good church should have the poor and the rich worshiping Jesus side by side with no partiality. I want to spend as much time with the homeless as I do with the millionaire. That's my heart. I, I, I want God to do that work in my life. I want to spend... Actually, here's the truth of it. Those who are in need should get extra care. That's God's heart. That's God's heart. And so a good church, we should be a church that has the stinky guy. If a stinky guy came in this morning, just ask yourself, be honest, would you love him? Would you love her? Could you sit by them? Would you ignore the stench for a little bit? Or are you too high for that? Would you move your chair? I remember uh, we had a guy come in here uh, who was homeless, as a matter of fact. And he would wear, uh, I think he was sexually deviant, and he would wear really inappropriate clothing. How, what do we do with that? A guy, not a girl, a guy. Uh, what do you do with that? You know what you do with that? You love them. You love them. Now, if you're a Christian gal and you come in here with inappropriate clothing, you know what you do with that? You strong gals who are strong in the Lord, you put your arm around that gal privately. Don't embarrass her. Wait till church is over. Pull her by your side and say, hey, sweetie, you know, you're, you're a beautiful girl, but your value is on the inside, not on the outside. And guide her and mentor her. But the lost, oh, we welcome in with open arms. And I love that. The rich and the poor coming together. The rich bless others with what they have and the poor blessing others with what they have. That's what church is meant to be. And that's what God wants for us. And we might think, well, hey, I'm not partial. James says, think it through. Think it through. Be honest with yourself. Are you judging according to the surface? Do you favor the rich? Do you favor the attractive? Think it through. Do you favor the pro athlete, the white person, the people well-connected in business, the thin person? Think it through. I saw a hidden camera TV show. You know what I'm talking about? Those hidden camera TV shows? You know what I'm talking about? I saw one where there was a, uh, a woman, very attractive, having car trouble on the side of the road. This was a setup. It was a... And she's very attractive, you know, nice dress on, 
damsel in distress on the side of the road. And guess how many people came over to pull over? Yeah, cars were like crossing four lanes to get over the freeway. You know, can I help you? Right? And then they did the same thing with a woman that wasn't so attractive. Did you see that? How many of you saw that? Okay, you, me, and two other people in the whole church. (laughs) What does that reveal about us? What does that reveal? You know, I don't think we're going to like what it reveals. You know what it reveals? It reveals that when we are partial like that, we have a judging heart and a selfish motive. That's what it reveals. It reveals we have a judging heart and a selfish motive. You might think, hey, it's not that big a deal. I mean, if rich guy sits up front and poor guy, here's what it reveals. We reveal something far more important than than who's sitting where. It reveals a heart issue. I'm told that you can have heart damage, you can have a clogged artery, and not even know it. It's a silent killer. And one day, heart attack. You know what? This is the same kind of thing. You might go through life, not even... And here's what God's saying. Say, no, 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 pay attention. This is a heart issue. You have a judging heart and a selfish motive. You see, when we are nice to the rich, to the famous, to the attractive, when we say, sit up here, let me ask you, when we are nice to the rich, who are we really loving? The rich man? Who are we really loving? Ourselves. Ourselves. Personal gain. And here's the problem. When our judgments are based on personal gain, justice is perverted. Congress needs to know that right now. Politicians need to know that right now. When our judgments are based on personal gain, justice is perverted. Righteousness is perverted. The love of God is perverted. The grace of God is perverted. And church no longer looks like church is supposed to look. When we ignore the poor to go have the jacuzzi party with Ronnie Rich, let me just ask you, who are we really loving? And I don't know why it is, but I have seen this true. It's so crazy. Think about this and and I'm going to ask you to vote on this. Tell me if you think this is true or not. Because I've seen this to be true. It's crazy. But people are more generous to rich people than they are poor people. People will buy nice gifts for a rich person more than they will for a poor person. Have you noticed that? I just want to know if I'm crazy or not. Have you seen that? Yeah, I'd say the vast majority. Isn't that nuts? How backwards is that? And here's what that reveals. Selfish love really misrepresents the love of God. The love of God. It really misrepresents God. It misrepresents God's love, God's grace. And you know what happens when that happens? Church then looks no different than the rest of the world. And we are to be a city on a hill. A light. I remember a year and a half ago when Nathan had his almost fatal accident, tremendous brain injury, and we did not know if he was going to come out of it or not. The love of Jesus Christ that came to that hospital, sometimes 150 people there in the waiting room. It was amazing. Morning, noon, night, late hours of the night. And you know what happened? The whole hospital staff, everyone in the hospital, it was that way for over a Two, you know, it was two weeks like that, people that. And here's what happened. The whole hospital, this is the question they would ask me over and over and over as my son's laying there in this ICU bed. Is he famous? What are all those people doing here? And it was the most powerful display of the love of Jesus Christ because I said, no. He's not famous at all. That's the the love of Jesus Christ. And I I shared the gospel more on those two weeks than 
That's how powerful it is when we love without partiality. And so, what does it look like in our daily life? Here's what it looks like. Instead of kissing up to our boss in hopes of a promotion, let's be really good to those who are the least of these. Let's be really good to those who are under you. Let's mentor and raise up and serve the least of these. Seeking to please God instead of our boss. And do you know what I know about God? When we do things His way, do you know what pours out of His hand? Abundant blessings. You can't outgive God. And if I know anything about God, here's what happens. you know who gets the promotion? The guy who's not looking for it. The guy who's just serving the least of these with all of his heart for the glory of God. And that's who God raises up. Last point I want to leave you with, and then we're going to take communion, is partiality, partiality to status. When we love the rich or whatever, partiality to status blinds us to God's will. And this is going to be a shocking statement, but when we are partial, we might actually be working against God. We might actually be going against Him. And I know none of us would want that. You'd, how many of you came to church today and say, yeah, I want to be against God? Yeah, none of us. So I know we don't want this. But here's the truth of it. When we are showing partiality, we, we might be actually working against God. And let me display that for you. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were committed to serving God. And they were just like us. They valued wealth. They valued status. They valued being honored to men. And we know in hindsight, we know looking back at the story, we know by reading the Gospels, they were blind to God's will. So much so that God could be standing right in front of them, and He was, and they were against Him. That's how much being partial to wealth and those kind of things can take you against God's will. You could be opposing God without even knowing it. On the flip side of that, there was a man by the name of John the Baptist. And he was out preaching, not in big crystal cathedrals. Where was John the Baptist preaching? Out in a field. Didn't even have a church. Just like us. Here we are to school. He was out in the field, didn't even have a church, and he's preaching. And his popularity began to increase. His message was power, he, powerful. He was in the center of God's will. His message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then one day, a big test happened to John. Do you know what that big test was? All the powerful religious leaders, the Billy Grahams of the world, the guy with the radio show, the guy with the crystal cathedral, the guy that could really help John to make his ministry take off, they all came out into the wilderness to see what John was doing. And you know what John did when all these rich and powerful people came to hear his service? Do you know what he did? He said, hey guys, ooh, you're really important. You came in a limo and you have a bodyguard. You guys come up here. Is that what John did? No, that's not what John did. As a matter of fact, John did just the opposite. Do you know what he said? He said, you bunch of snakes. You stinking rich dudes who love the wealth of man more than the praise of God, who love the honor and praise of man more than the praise of God, get the heck out of here and go forth first and show fruits worthy of repentance. And then come and get baptized. Why did he say that? Because he didn't care about their soul? No, quite the contrary. Because he did. When you are trusting in your wealth, you are not trusting in God. When you are think you are righteous, you can't receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. John was telling them the truth, what he needed to hear. And because he wasn't caught up and enamored with their prosperity, because he wasn't looking and judging superficially, he could keep himself 
direct center in the will of God. And he was led by God and inspired by God. Does that make sense? Let's not let partiality blind us to the will of God. I wonder, how many great friendships have I missed because I judged according to appearance? How many great ministry opportunities have I missed because I judged according to appearance? How many great songs has the world missed because the artist wasn't attractive enough to make it through auditions? May it not be so for the church of Jesus Christ. May it not be so. May we not miss out on the will of God. 